game of golf. It's anything from that frustrating afternoon fill-in full of gin shots, slices, air shots and hooks into the woods, to Tiger Woods. Somewhere between scratch and social these days is Ian Dobson, a competitive representative golfer in his prime. For him, almost nothing beats an early AM round with wife Doreen. But part of the beauty of getting on the course early is leaving the afternoon or evening open for Dobby's other passion. Since he was 10 years old, Ian Dobson's been caught between golf courses and race courses. I was born up in New Brighton and uh, half a mile from me was a New Brighton race course which is now Queen Elizabeth Park and uh, after I did my paper round so on I used to go over there and muck out stables and uh, just jog horses for the likes of George Cameron and Isaacson and the Frosts, Manny Edwards, Stan Edwards, and the, I knew them all and used to work. Um, I used to get six months a week in those days. And of course, if they didn't win, I didn't get the six months. So I had to be pretty, uh, had to love the horses pretty well to carry on on that. Quite often I used to see the uh, trainers take somebody behind the uh, sheds and give him a bit of a working over and I'd say what's going on there and they'd say that guy never paid his bill. So I always said to myself I will never own a racehorse until I could afford it. And that day came probably around about 1980 when uh, Doreen thought she'd buy me a horse for a Christmas present so we went out and had a look at this horse and it was a, a, a yearling. We bought it and um, we changed its name where it was to, to jam cover because in those days I had a business making jam covers and I had after that I raced her and bred seven or eight foals Murray Edmonds trained them and they all qualified but of those I only got one winner No surprise that a great day's golf was the source of Ian's greatest days going to the racetrack Merv Rogers who uh, you know he owns Happy Asset uh, him and I we were in one or two gallopers and we were playing golf one day and uh, he said why don't we spend some real money and get a horse to go to Australia and I was the first to say yep. Uh, we did buy one and that horse was Royal Creation. Went on to win a million dollars just on. Mostly place money because a very very good horse but only seemed to manage to get second but uh, he was beaten by champions. Uh, it, that took me to Australia many many times, 14 times in one year once following Royal Creation and Ray Verner trained him who was then arguably the best trainer of gallopers in New Zealand and I met people like Tommy Smith and the Cummings and after the races have a beer with them because they were very friendly with Ray and we're on first name basis with them and uh, it, I said to myself now why are they getting the winners? And that horse Royal Creation gave Dobby the big time buck and the Caulfield Cup field is set to go. Dr Grace began quickly with Royal Creation. What he wanted now was a top flight Gold trotter though, because for all the Caulfield Cups, the, the colossal checks owning a thoroughbred racehorse can bring, harness racing's what had been in his blood since he was a lad. The dreams were of Cups at Addington rather than Flemington. So when I came back I thought, well I've got to get the best. And in those days uh, Brian O'Meara was a sort of uh, an idol in Auckland uh, before my time and he was in Canterbury and uh, to my knowledge um, he was just sort of knocking around so I went to Brian and I said I'd like you to train a horse for me. The Dobson O'Meara team had some success without setting the world on fire but a pro with a legendary eye for a young horse Brian O'Meara was always on the lookout for that animal that was a bit special. I was out at David Shadbolt's and uh, he had about nine yearlings in a paddock and uh, to me there was one horse stood out and they told me at the time he was by Sockies Adam and I'd had tight connections with quite a few of the good Sockies Adams and I was quite pretty keen on him and uh, every time I drove past here I just could see him and he just sort of stood out all the time. And the only brief I had from Brian was 
uh, the mayor had a white blaze, so we went to David and he said, well, I'll have to come out with you because that little colt won't be with his mother. He said he's not interested in his mother except for feeding. Sure enough, uh, he was out there um, running around with the other colts. And of course, when I came out to have a look at him, he came past me in a, in a pace with his head held high, just like he races today. And How old is he at this stage? I think about three months. And I was pretty impressed. And then on the way back, he did another turn past me, again in a full pace with his head held high, as much as to say, Mr Dobson, you should buy me. I'm better than the rest. Well, what could I do? So I went and inquired about him and uh, see if we could buy him. And uh, again, I said that he's by sockies at him. And then I found his buy uh, in the pocket, which he was a new season sign. Uh, we weren't quite so sure whether we should buy him be by in the pocket, but uh, I just thought he was such an outstanding horse, so we did. Wheeler dealer Dobson was instructed by his trainer to nab the horse no matter what then owner Paul Bealby wanted to charge. He was that special. At that time he wanted 15000 for him and I said to Brian, that's dearer than what we've been paying. And Brian said, buy him. So Ian Dobson being a wheeler and dealer, I offered him 10 So he said, no, I won't take 10 but uh, he said, I'll, I'll keep a quarter share and you give me 10000 for that three quarters, which I did. Three months later, Brian said to me, Dobby he said, I told you to buy all this horse, he's a very, very good horse. So I went back to Bilby and asked him to buy the quarter share and after a bit of haggling, I finished up paying 15,000 for that quarter. So that's when uh, the Brian and Mira, the Dorian Dobson, the Ian Dobson, got into that horse and we raced it uh, in those colours. Ian did have occasion to reflect on what he might have been doing with his $30,000 because when it got down to the nitty gritty of breaking in, the in the pocket colt from Pleasant Franco wasn't scoring too highly. He, he was a proper devil really. Uh, he uh, would refuse to go around the track probably more than twice and uh, he would pull up and flick his tail and then he'd try and uh, run off and I'd had about five or six people out trying to stop him running off at one stage. So then I wasn't sure I could leave my colt. But then after weeks of routine and repetition, it all finally clicked. And that long, loping, relaxed stride in an unnatural gait became second nature. Almost overnight, the in-the-pocket colt could run as good as he looked. Once he accepted it, uh, he probably was in work probably nearly three months before I knew that he had something special about him. He just had a flawless way of going and he felt like he had great speed. Brian told me after he was a year old, um, he said this horse could be the best we've ever seen. Brian O'Meara had made his name developing two-year-old paces. Not just good ones, but champion juveniles, like two a peck a night, beaten only once in ten starts. Type Connection, the winner of more than a million dollars and the best youngster Robert Cameron had ever driven, including young Quinn. This fella, though, was better than all of those, according to someone who would know. This guy felt like he could... He felt like an older horse. He felt like, as a two-year-old, he was about four. O'Meara horses at trials and workouts are a respected breed. Right. They look fast and fit and larger <laughs> than life. But when this yeah, well, latest piece of work like stepped out in a two-year-old yeah. trial yeah. on October 1996, onlookers thought well, right. the big powerhouse horse was in the wrong heat. Other owners would think he's a three-year-old. He was so mature. And uh, Christian Cullen bowling along in front, out by about a length and a quarter, followed then in the trail by... Bob. I can remember that well. Mark Jones was driving him. It was, it was quite outstanding, and you, you, may, you may have that tape. And that's Christian Cullen, the leader, out by a length and a quarter now. Then Tim's Pride, the inside, Von Salina, a length and a half back. Then they were followed the outside by uh, Fast and Free and just on its inner. Uh, we've got Classic Knight, but now Christian Cullen starting to assert his superiority over the rest. Round the bend he comes, and he scampers away. He's up by four lengths now, down to the 200 metres. And uh, then we've got Von Salina, it's all over here. Christian Cullen stretching right out. He's up by seven, eight lengths. He's away. And down to the line, Mark Jones hasn't moved on him. And uh, Christian Cullen's hit the line, eight lengths in front. Second home with Bron Salina. Then we've got Classic Knight getting through late for third. The outside, Tim's Pride. And Fast and Free has come home at the back of the field.